I'm Yang Chai, a university professor and director at the Center for Craniofacial Molecular Biology at the University of Southern California. Today, I have the distinctive honor to talk with my dear friend, mentor, and long-term colleague, Professor Harold Slavke. What was your vision for the NIDCR? Well, first, um, thank you for making time for this, Yang. I appreciate it very much. And uh, our friendship has taken many, many different forms. And this is yet another form. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The leadership of the IADR and the, the men and women at the NIDR were very, very strategic, very creative. We're trying to take advantages of different things for funding, for building buildings, for getting it all off the ground, because starting with a piece of bare land, uh, it, it, takes, it takes a while to build an institute and to get a reputation and for to be able to sustain 75 years of continuous innovation, um, taking advantage of possibilities that didn't exist, and those still prevail today. And uh, the, 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 the summary is that the IADR is alive and well, as is the NIDR with a slight modification of adding a C for craniofacial to better reflect the overall portfolio of what we support and justifications of why we support those things. And that particular strategic decision really opened up some, some wonderful avenues for future growth and for better understanding of our mission and what we were up to. At the middle of December of 1995, uh, I, we had been at the NIH at that time for about five months, and we were invited to a holiday party by uh, uh, the then Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, oh who was um, an amazing five foot tall Wonder Woman. Uh, and uh, she, along with a thousand plus other people, were at Constitution Hall. And um, uh, uh, we went around and said hello, and we were greeted, and so forth. And then after a while, um, I saw that um, someone was there who I didn't know personally, had, but I knew of as a celebrity. And I asked a mutual friend if he knew this person and he, if he would introduce me. So we go across this room of a thousand people oh. and we come up and he introduces me to, to, to Walter Cronkite. My mouth becomes parched and dry. Um, I shake his hand. He holds my hand with both of his hands, and he says to me, and he like leans forward, like really close, and he says, you know, I wanted to be a dentist more than anything in the world. My father was a dentist. My grandfather was a dentist. This is, this is fantastic for me. Tell me, what are you going to do here? What's your, what's your goal? What's your, what, what are you about? What did you aim to accomplish during your tenure as the director of an IDCR? A simple answer to that very complicated question is it takes a village. If you don't have a village with various diverse points of view, it's very hard to move something as big and complicated as an institute at the NIH. So uh, Lois, my, my wife, was a uh, urban planner trained in graduate school at UCLA and knew a lot about strategic planning. And we put our heads together and thought through, what can we do? So th at the time, there were 450 employees at the NIDR. We invited groups of 10 every week on Wednesdays <laughs> to our home for wine and cheese and discussion and began to get to know people on a more personal basis. Then separately, invited the editors of all of the news communication people that have anything to do with oral health to come for a symposium to tell them the story of the Dental Institute, um, what's its budget, 
how many people, what's its impact, how many people benefit, and began that process. We then started a series of patient um, groups who were sort of assembled because of their, their interest in a disease, like uh, ectodermal dysplasia has a, an institute, the National Institute of Dental Ectodermal Dysplasia. And so we met the director, uh, we brought her to Washington, she gave testimony to the congressional committees, and we did that for each of the growths, Sjogren's, oral cancer, and so forth. So that way of building a community that had leverage, that could influence Congress, that could influence the dental profession, that could influence Congress and the larger society, seemed to make sense as the way to move this, this battleship through these treacherous waters and go forward. Every Monday, the directors of all of the institutes meet in Building One, and at that time, Harold Barmas chaired and led those discussions. And um, uh, there was a, an energy in the air, and they were talking about doubling their budgets. And Barmas put into play that if each of us understand one another's budgets and how they're formulated and what they mean, that perhaps when we are in small one-on-one -on -one conversations with congressional leadership, we can share some of that information and demonstrate the potential for collegiality. So I did that, the other directors did that, and it clearly was made a difference. And so translating that, you know, sort of into practice, it meant getting to know Tony Fauci, yeah. having a series of luncheons together, uh, discovering that the mouth is an immunological treasure, yeah. that it could be used for determining AIDS uh, and, and very early detection. The Greenspans were working in San Francisco, were coming up with some very interesting work, and so we began to build and put those things together. Um, sort of a surprise to some of us was diversity. Um, diversity in the disease package. The more we looked at the Institute, the more we learned about human disease in the United States and the scale of the disease uh, and the cost of the disease and the lack of addressing a number of these diseases, so-called health disparities. So um, through that building collections of people, uh, working with Tony, uh, uh, working with the Cancer Institute to develop new cancer centers, we were able to co-fund five new cancer centers uh, with uh, the, the uh, uh, leadership at the, the Cancer Institute, uh, and things began to happen. And then one of the things that was a hallmark activity was the creation of centers for oral disparities. Uh, and uh, we, we were able to fund seven of them in collaboration with um, the, um, uh, another institute. Uh, and in so doing, we were able to raise more money, address this, and we funded seven of them in the first round. And that turned out to be extremely useful in a political sense that we were at the table, we were addressing these issues, we were looking at men and women and children of color, we were looking at newborn babies, we were looking at elderly and so forth. And uh, it, it affected funding and it affected the spirit of our collection of people. It was a very good decision. What was your most memorable moment as the director of NIDCR? The, the one that stands out uh, is, is the Walter Cronkite connection. That was very special. Um, another was, um, there's a young woman um, who is now uh, a faculty member at Georgetown University. And uh, I met her father and then met her and brought her into the lab and she was one of those like high school students in the lab, and she just took to it like, like, like a duck to water. I mean, it was just fantastic. And um, as a consequence of that, it opened up the opportunity for NIDR intramural scientists
to bring in a few people out of high school to help the students develop, but also help in the, in the institute. Um, and those moments stand out, special luncheons and dinners and hugs and kisses and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and many of those young people went on to graduate school and medical school and industry and you know those kinds of things. Um, but the, the human interactions are the most memorable. Thank you so much, Hal. My pleasure. Really this opportunity to talk My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.